Welcome to another episode of the Distributed Data Show brought to you by Datastax Academy, where we bring you the latest news and interview technical experts to help you succeed at building large-scale distributed systems. Welcome everyone to the Distributed Data Show. I'm Patrick McFadden. I'm live here in the studio in San Francisco. With me today is Jeff Carpenter. And on the line, all the way from Denver, Colorado, we have Luke Tillman. Hey, Luke. Hello, fellow humans. And as a guest today, we have uh, David Gilardi, who's also a host. But we're just going to pretend like you're a guest today. Today, he's a guest. Today, he's guesty. He's got that I guest feel very like. guesty. Yeah, you Hello. should. And very guesty. So, David, this is gonna this is gonna be a little question and answer. I think just to set up, um, you know, you you came here to DataStacks as somewhat new to this uh, what we what we build, Cassandra DataStacks Enterprise, and I would uh, I think it'd be really helpful to share your experience as someone who's brand new to this, for people who also are new to this because that's a pretty common problem. Or I hear people say, "How do I get started?" Exactly. So before we dive into the uh, Cassandra DataStacks Enterprise learning experience, David, why don't you set the stage for us and tell us a little about your background? Okay. Yeah. So let's see. So I've got uh, uh, over 20 years experience in IT programming and, and databases. Um, the one time in the past, the certified Oracle DBA, but that was a long time ago, so I don't really count that anymore. Um, had time in MySQL, Postgres, uh, Microsoft. Uh, SQL Server, a lot of OLAP stuff. Uh, let's see, from the programming standpoint, my core is Java, but I've pretty much coded in all the major languages, uh, even some odd ones and like Lingo and you know, like Lingo. shell scripting, Perl, JavaScript. Yeah, Lingo's awesome. Lingo. There's a whole other <laughs> whole other thing we could do. Lingo is actually underrated, but I'm not going to go there now because I'm going to totally do an, a different thing that we're doing now. <laughs> there are no we ship no drivers for Lingo. Don't even ask. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, and then from the um, uh, from the IT perspective, you know, I, I spent the actually in the beginning of my career, um, I was working on operations and monitoring of large enterprise systems. Thing, you know, infrastructure on the an order of hundreds of thousands of uh, server and network devices, that kind of deal. I've always had um, lots of operations and DevOps kind of work. Uh, I eventually turned into uh, you know a lot of AWS cloud kind of stuff and and spun up a. Uh, a whole set of different infrastructure and, and you know application systems and that kind of deal uh, on the cloud. You had some real experience then. You are. I would hope so. You're a real engineer, so. a real one. Yes, you're not just a fancy I hat like, guy. You're I like to think engineer. so. Yeah, but I'm glad you like the hat. I'm glad you like the hat. Those are important. That's yeah, important. no, it's it's great. I know you have one with a beard that includes. Someday we'll we'll include that in in the show, but today it's just a bit much. Um, the beard oh, one is really. Um, so you you came, I mean, obviously have a, a wealth of experience behind this, but did you have any experience with Cassandra or Datastax Enterprise and any of the technologies inside of it? I mean, there's a lot of different technologies, of course. You could have experience with some bits and pieces. Where where was your experience? Yeah, so coming into Datastax, um, the only thing that I probably had some experience with uh, from from a previous uh, from a previous company and, and some work there would have been solar right mm. uh, so so that obviously now as far as DSC you know powers the the search component uh, but other than that I mean I had a ton of relational database experience but when it came to uh, Cassandra Spark Graph any of that stuff totally new right so I, I came into it a uh, pretty pretty newbish if you will as far as the uh, the data stack stack goes. So you mentioned relational databases, but what about any other kind of distributed databases or um, maybe even distributed systems? So, you know, like people argue these days, everybody building distributed systems because all web apps are distributed, but uh, you know, yeah. what about dis distribu distributed databases, distributed systems, that kind of experience? Yeah, you know, it's funny you said it just the way you did because um, as you were asking me that question, so what, what comes to mind is, you know, from the distributed database standpoint, I mean, in all actuality, no. Uh, now, now, I, I definitely yeah, sharding have to does not count. We we remember that sharding. Yeah, 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 that's one of them. I'm not going to yeah. count that. Friends don't let friends <laughs> shard, and that's not a distributed <laughs> database. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just going to play uh, play that. Wow. Make sure everyone knows that. I'm a little opinionated on this. Throwing thing. that card out there right now. Yeah, no, this is really. We're not going to talk about any sharding I did then. Yeah, yeah I'll just right. pass that by. Yeah, just keep it to yourself. <laughs> yeah, we got. 
we had um, a lot of infrastructure that would say have situations where we had master slave kind of architecture where slaves were, you know, replicas um, that were spread out geographically, you know, and, and um, multiple zones and that kind of deal. But I, that's not really a distributed database kind of thing. Um, from the application standpoint, um, again, especially dealing with uh, the cloud, um, you know, I've, I've built a lot of applications that were designed from the ground up to, again, be distributed in the sense right, that uh, you had uh, instances that were spread across multiple regions and that kind of deal um, and load balance properly with that kind of thing. But that's not, I don't think that's a distributed you're probably asking about, Luke. Uh, so I would say that's probably no, uh, that I didn't, other than uh, doing stuff, like I said, with um, geographic distribution and such, I didn't really have any experience with distributed, true distributed systems. Okay, so David, we've established that you know you had a little background with distributed systems, but not really with distributed databases. So yeah. you're faced with this task. This is now your job, being good at Apache Cassandra and Data Stacks Enterprise. So how did you go about doing this? Where did you jump in? Did, were you just like, you downloaded it and you just started doing stuff or training or how did you get going with it? Well, part of it kind of started with a prodding from Patrick, funny enough. Um, because before I even started, uh, he had me uh, already looking into the DSA, the, the Data Sex Academy courses, right, to, to actually get into some of that material. But generally, my philosophy on this kind of thing, like I'm a shiny object kind of guy. I love getting into new knowledge, new things. Um, so I will usually jump into, say, you know, like reading material and whatever, whatever stuff like that. But at the same time, I got to get my hands on the keyboard. That just has to happen in order for me to make the connection and, and really put it all together. Um, so it was, you know, I went through pretty much all of the DSA material, all of the courses. Uh, and at the same time, I actually ordered a set of Raspberry Pis. I have a blog post on this, by the way, that uh, shameless plug, shameless plug. But, yeah, um, solid move with the Raspberry Pis. But... <laughs> thank you. Um, oh, you're no, and that, that was an adventure, let me tell you. you know, so I, I ordered a set of Raspberry Pis and actually set up my own cluster. Uh, started, you know, and since I have an operations background and I really like blinky lights and that kind of deal, um, I, you know, got an op center with that. Uh, then eventually moved into LCM, the lifecycle manager, uh, to kind of work on auto deploying all of my nodes and that. But I did those together, right? And what was interesting too is that the the academy materials, the courses, they provided like I'm I'm so glad I went through them because well one they're they're really nice um, they're they're really quite I mean the, they have good production values they actually get quite deep right and and in particular the um, uh, the VMs that are provided with the ex exercises and, and such like that they ask like hard questions they don't just give you the answers to like you have to fight to to learn which is great. So that gave me a base level of understanding. And then there were so many new tidbits that came out of those that when I was doing my own cluster for real, if I had not done that, I would have made a ton of ton of mistakes, right? I still made mistakes. Um, but it was so anyway, so it was a combination of both really. So to answer your question, I did both the courses and then I set up my own cluster um, you know, with, the, with the Raspberry Pis and eventually uh, evolved that into my EC2 instances and things like right. that. So uh, that was a pretty high bar. If you think about like the resource constraints of a, of a Raspberry Pi, I mean, was there, yeah. were there any right. configuration parameters in the Cassandra.yaml file that you didn't have to touch? Raspberry uh, Pi is a, <laughs> is a constraint, period. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What was yeah, that like? like okay. so I actually loved doing it on the Pis. I think the Pis are awesome. Um, it, was, it was nice because you know, I could do, they're not terribly expensive. I can get them up and running, but you're absolutely right. Talk about like low commodity stuff. Um, yeah, I had to tweak a lot of stuff to get it to just barely run. Um, I would not recommend it for production. <laughs> so if you're, if you're watching this, you're like, oh yeah, I'm gonna do Raspberry Pi. No, don't do that. That's, that's do it for training and, and learning and that kind of deal. But no, it was, that was part of the challenge. Um, not only that, the OS that's being used, you know, like it offered, uh, some challenges in what type of installation, how to get things set up, the amount of memory I could allocate, all sorts of things. The speed of the disks, which are really just, yes, you know, like, yeah, the chips on there. So it's, they're great for learning. As a matter of fact, in some ways, you could even argue that it was better to do it on those because it gave me an idea of what the lowest bar could be <laughs> for actually trying to run the stuff. And, and it, forced me to get into some configuration parameters and stuff that if I had beefier machines, I probably wouldn't have even had to know about. 
So as you know, I have a, a long history with Raspberry Pis and destroying them. I think they're fantastic, but <laughs> I did get a little grief from the Raspberry Pi community. I don't care. I, I think you fun. earned that. Yeah, a little bit. Um, but it did show that, that they do work in the worst possible way. Um, <laughs> So, well, uh, we, and, and along those lines, one of the things that I ended up doing, um, which was really quite informational on in this, uh, going about this way, once I had my cluster set up, right, and I was, you know, essentially tailing out all of my, all of my node logs and that kind of deal, um, I would purposely um, rip out, you know, the, the Ethernet cable from a Raspberry Pi or two or something like that and see what my cluster did. Mm -hmm, it was mm -hmm. really kind of neat, actually to watch, the, again, coming from the, the experience I did with relational databases and dealing again with like master-slave architectures and that kind of deal, you just didn't do that kind of thing. Um, and it was really neat. That was one of those wow moments I had with Cassandra in general. Watching this thing, I'd yank one of those out and then watching it essentially kind of repair itself and get everything going again. It was from a resiliency standpoint, that was really neat to go through. So with the Raspberry Pis, it was easy to do because uh, I could just rip a cable out. So it was, yeah, that's that a lot cheaper cool. than hitting it with an axe, too. Um, yes, although less that is fun. true, but I think um, the axe might be a little more fun. So, I mean, that, so the Raspberry Pi experience for you was, um, I think, really good, and you might have, have upped the, uh, the level of, of hard on this. I mean, it, this gave you a lot to work with, but in general, how is the learning curve? I mean, because there's a lot to learn already. It's a huge topic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let's see. So from the learning curve standpoint, I really kind of see two levels. I see there's the, the easy, the easy part up here, which is okay. So I came into this with pretty much no knowledge of any of the data stacks enterprise stuff, except for like I said, a little bit of solar and that kind of deal. So I was able to go in and download DSE, get it running, and and the example I want to use with this is I'm thinking about it, is at a previous company where we implemented solar, right? Um, in order to do that with our app, with a relational database and the way we did it and all that, we had to learn solar, we had to deploy it, we had to write the code in our app, with the connector to actually talk to the thing so we could get data over to it. We had to write the piece that does all the polling that you know got the data to it on a you know pretty often basis and that kind of deal. Um, so we had to know a lot about what was going on with solar before we could even get going, right? So one of the moments I had when I when I pulled down DSC and I was I was working with this stuff is to enable solar was a command line switch. Like I was like, oh, that's awesome, right? And then yeah, of, of course you have to, um, uh, of course you have to, you know, you have to enable search index, things like that, a little bit of configuration, but the amount of configuration I had to do to get that running with search was totally different from what I had to do at a previous company where I actually had to implement and deploy solar. So from that standpoint, from that's what I mean by that easy part, right? If I wanna just skim the top of things between search graph, you know, analytics and, and Cassandra, you could download the stuff and kind of get going, right? Without knowing it too deep, you got to know some stuff. But now that that's where it goes from the easy and now it goes deep because the second uh -huh. you even get into like in Cassandra, even something what seems simple like replication factor and consistency levels, right? Um, you can totally do that wrong. Oh, and yeah. I have experienced doing that wrong. Um, and that in itself, right, depending on uh, the size of your cluster, how many nodes you have, what you're trying to do, that in itself can can take some thought. There's some complexity there. Uh, graph is another great example to me. I love graph. It's just so powerful. It's neat and everything. Um, but that's one that gets complex really fast. So again, you can skim the surface and you can have that easy kind of learning curve. But then the second you start digging in, it gets pretty deep fast for pretty much all of them. So for lack of a, a better word, David, I want to talk about uh, I want to talk about baggage for a second. Oh. So. So uh, you, you kind of mentioned, you know, at a previous, I mean, you just talked about having previous experience with solar. And I think, you know, for most of us out there, you know, we, unless we just came out of school and, and you know, haven't had any work experience yet or, or training or something like that, a lot of us have prior experience like you and I with relational databases. Oh, and yeah. so I'm curious, what was, you know, kind of what was that like, like, you know, bringing the baggage of, you know, relational Star database issue. experience <laughs> with you, you know, what, like, was it helpful? Was it hurtful? Like, you know, what, um, you know, kind of on balance, kind of how was that coming from relational database? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good question. So one of the, <laughs> it's, uh, it's funny you asked this, because one of the ones that I still struggle with today, right, is coming from now decades in the relational database world and designing tables, schemas, all that kind of deal, right? Is it's pounded into you from day one, third normalized form, 
right? And generally, you stay away from replicating data around all your different tables and that kind of deal. You know, you, you try to you try to cut down on that as much as you absolutely can and use joins and, and such to, to kind of handle that. But in the in the distributed database world, Cassandra and that kind of deal, it is totally common. Uh, and and depending on you know the, the needs of your application, like what questions you're trying to answer, to have multiple tables sitting right next to each other, some of them with the same data across them, right? Because it's all denormalized. Um, so that is something that uh, that I still sometimes feel like I'm doing it wrong. Like I must be doing this wrong because I've just been doing it a certain way with relational databases for forever. Um, so yeah, so that was definitely. I guess that would be on the to answer kind of your the way you posed that. The kind of the hurt, right? That's part of the ones that I still struggle with, um, and and making sure I have that correct. It's now from like Stockholm syndrome, the whole yeah. thing. <laughs> it takes you a while to you know, get over that. <laughs> uh, no, I'm okay with you, Oracle. I really am. <laughs> Thank you for giving me a great database. I love you. Yeah, that's Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, maybe. Maybe it is a little Stockholm Syndrome. Yeah, and, you know, but from the um, um, from the help standpoint, um, you know, I guess there, there are a couple things there. Um, one, uh, if you are, if you come from the relational world at all, right, you're familiar with SQL. And the transition to CQL was, there, there was no transition. I mean, it was absolutely seamless. It's just like it. I mean, you've got select statements, you've got alters. I mean, maybe, you know, that's obviously not all the commands, but like you've got the same semblance and, and the same style that you you would have been used to doing things before. I mean, there's some sy syntactic differences. Um, maybe if you're using Spark or whatever, you know, you get this something a little bit different, but generally it felt just like what I was used to. So there was really no transition from that. So if you got that experience, it's great. Um, one of the other parts, now this is going to sound, this might sound a little obvious, <laughs> but at the end of the day, like coming from a relational database background and coming in then to, you know, this Cassandra, it's, a, it's also a database. The same concepts, you know, all the same ideas and stuff transfer over, right? It's a different approach. Yes, absolutely. But it, it's still a database at the end of the day. So that was something I actually think that experience with the relational world, again, kind of came right over and understanding kind of what's going on right with uh with cassandra so yeah i'd say that was kind of those those were some of the helpful parts there cool so all right david uh i think that we're gonna collectively now uh proclaim you no longer a noob yeah like oh, I feel so or is it just gonna happen <laughs> i think we just declared it we just declared it to be so you don't so, get to be that anymore yeah so okay as a as a former yeah. noob with wow. uh, Cassandra and DSE, you're now standing on the other side of this divide. Wow, it feels so different here. And your your advice, let's say uh, I'm a new developer and I am yeah. I'm now in the position that you were in just a short time ago. What is your advice to me? What are my key takeaways on how to get started? Wrap it up yeah, for us. Yeah, okay. Well, so for the first thing, I mean, honestly, this is gonna go back a little bit to uh, some Don't of the stuff lingo. we were talking about. Don't say lingo. <laughs> It's not linked. No, well, okay. Oh man. All right. Okay. All right. Just making sure. <laughs> I, I wasn't okay. I was gonna do it, but now you've kind of changed my all mind. Right. So yeah, yeah. no, I, <laughs> yeah, going back to one of the things we kind of talked about in the beginning. Um I I'm one of those people, just my general philosophy, like I said, I, I gotta get my hands on the keyboard, but I'm also gonna look at whatever material is there. Um the the Data Sex Academy stuff, the if you're starting out new, the courses, I mean, even if you're not, there's some advanced stuff in there, but they're really well done really good production values get into them and they're free that was one of the things i kept doing um is i was i didn't know they were free at the time but when i first started i kept saying to myself my god i would totally pay for these like like i wish i had this previously and then i found out later they were free and i thought that's kind of awesome but the amount of time they spent on them um the especially the vms with the exercises get into those they will give you so many so much good information starting out right but at the same time you got to get your hands on the keyboard, um, whether it's Raspberry Pis or spin up some EC2 instances or something. Create your own cluster. Like, do that. You know, because I went to DSA Live as well, um, and in there, yeah, you you go through this whole thing where you actually have a multi-node cluster and stuff, but it's all in the same instance. The second I started working with um, separate individual servers with their own IPs and, and different networks and that kind of deal, it it changed my level of understanding because there's more that you have to take into account. So get your hands on the keyboard. You know, get some get some pies or get some easy two instances, and and go take a look at the courses and do them both, honestly. Uh, and I think that'll probably give you all the information you need to get going and kind of point you in the directions to 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 move on your own. 
Wow. All right. That's I'd, some pretty solid advice. Yeah, I don't, I'm. I'm. Um, I'm pretty happy about that. I think now. Now I'm just going to point everyone to this video and say, well, "How do you get started?" I got a video for you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, thanks a lot, David, for being our guest this time around. You can be host next time. Okay. You've graduated. Ooh. Right. I graduated. That's awesome. That's so good. Yeah. <laughs> um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you for joining us again for the Distributed Data Show. We love your feedback. So go to the Distributed Data Show page on Data Stacks Academy and tell us what you think. You can also find us on the Data Stacks Academy YouTube channel or find our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get great podcasts. While you're there, make sure and subscribe so you don't miss a single episode.